flow of debt first, because that's been something that's been bandied around. And let me just give you some quick figures. 2008, council debt, 128 million. 2009, because of the 82 million from the water, which no one really wanted, 46 million. Currently, 2012, the debt is 53 million. Between the years 2004 and 2008, the debt was raised by $28 million. In the current term of council, the debt has only been increased from the, uh, the new level of $42 million by $13 million over four years. So let's just put to bed the idea about the debt. We have the lowest debt of the major councils in South East Queensland. We have the lowest, our debt per property is about $900. Our debt per property in its which is about six thousand five and a half thousand dollars. So we are a low debt camp with uh, low requirements to repay it and no intention of, of taking the debt out beyond uh, what is we consider to be reasonable and very conservative. Borrow for intergenerational projects. We don't borrow for short term, we don't borrow for projects for maintenance of our current assets. We borrow, for example, for the landfill remediation. The land, we've got 26 of those little landfills across the state. The, uh, just to do the eastern batter of one part of the landfill at Birkdale is $7 million. That's the sort of we borrow for those long-term intergenerational projects. We pay for our asset management and asset maintenance from our general revenue. Our debt servicing ratio, as has been said, is well below the target, but the target ratio, and, uh, and we are well below what is perhaps budgeted. Let's just bring up <coughs> a few of the issues. We lost the water win, and despite what anyone says, water return gave a return to council has since water was established. That return was lost. There were changes to the uh, the whole distribution and uh, the makeup of water. That cost money to establish those processes. The infrastructure charges were capped by the state, uh, and uh, with the, the loss of uh, uh, grants because of the state situation and the federal government situation, there was a loss of grant money available to councils. So what did we do? We revised our long-term strategy, we reviewed the way we did business, we undertook some rating reform, we found extensive operational savings and we certainly budgeted to improve and to uh, strengthen our financial position. In terms of rates on the southern Morton Bay Islands, we, we undertook rating reform. We're at a point we couldn't continue the existing previous process because we were at the point of infringing the local government. So we had to change. But what we did uh, to reduce the impact on the land owners, the people who live here, who uh, over the last two years have probably paid in many cases less equal to or less rates than what they pay, we've actually increased the, the pressure on the investors that is the people like myself who has an empty house that I holiday in, but I pay a high level of tax because I'm client as an investor and the vacant land Now, if we change that, we then, we either do, we do one or two things. We change the balance and we put more of the, the, uh, uh, the, the cost back onto the residents who live here. And we've tried to keep that at a lower level. Or we reduce the amount of revenue that comes from the island. And we seriously have to look at that. We cannot increase the rates. We've identified that we cannot increase the rates. So there are two, there's a, a, a focus for us. Do we reduce our expenditure? Do we change the balance and take the, the uh, owners off, the vacant landowners and the investors, or to, and put it on to the president? And that's a clear choice that council will have to make. But we've been particularly conscious to look after our, look after our residents. Because our, our uh, financial uh, uh, situation, for example, in this last year, we anticipated that we would require uh, a certain amount of money for our operational, uh, uh, our operational projections, we brought that down by $10 million. We reduced that by $10 million. So how did we do that? We did, there were two choices. Increase rates, decrease expenditure. Have efficiencies, increase productivity. That's what we did. We determined we could not increase rates. So we did. We have cut out uh, $10 million out of our budget. We are looking at another $20 million to be cut out over the next two years because we want to return to an operational deficit. Across the board, council has lots of cash in the bank. Um, 
and we need that to be able to have five, uh, three to five months uh, in the payment in advance. In advance. So council can run if something happens, we have those funds there. But what we said was we will find internal savings. We, go, we offered the redundancy. There were 18 in the first round, 12 in the second round. Where did we target? We targeted middle management. When I came into council, there were more middle managers than I had. I was a senior manager, a senior officer in the Department of Crime Industries with 5,000 staff serving the whole state. I had more levels of middle management when I came into this council than I had in GPI. We are looking at progressively, as we can, to reduce that burden and that layer of middle management and expect people to take responsibility for delivering their jobs. So we did that. We didn't renew contracts. As contracts expired, they were not renewed. Um, and we, um, we made sure that any positions that were appointed had freeze on positions, that those positions were warranted. We produced a new financial strategy. We still, as I said, have to put $20 million worth of savings, productivity improvements over the next two years. And then that will give us a, a small financial uh, um, a surplus. 2000, the Queensland Treasury Corporation warned Council that it needed to be looking at its finances. 2011, and I have the, what they've said here, I won't read it to you now. 2011, they came back and they said Council's financial management was equal to the best in South East Queensland. That we had done very well and when asked, what do we need to do? What do we need to tell our officers to do? We, the Queensland Treasury Corporation, the statutory Authority, independent statutory authority said, do exactly what you are continuing to do. So, for us in terms of rates, the issue is, do we change the balance? We know we're probably going to have to reduce the revenue from the rates. Do you want us to return the balance around so the resident pays more than the investor, or do we keep it as it is? And bear the pain, because I can tell you we get the phone calls and the emails regularly from people. So, um, we have been very conscious, very conscious of financial management. I think there are ways we can do things better on the islands. And we need to look at some of the work practices. And we're talking about that, in uh, looking at that in terms of fast tracking roads. Are there more efficient ways to deliver the services? Because every time a truck comes over on that uh, bus or that jet on that barge, it costs a lot of money. More important for us to look at what's going to happen in, in the future uh, as opposed to how we arrive at this position. But let me just state that when this council took over, the last four years, 2008, debt had actually been reduced to $46 million due to water asset compensation that had started prior to this <coughs> council uh, taking the reins. It happened until two after. The negotiations occurred all through that period and the compensation was paid into our bank account on that day. The reality is that this council has a financial strategy that plans to be going from $46 million at the beginning of this term of council to $100 million at the end of their next term of council if they're returned. That's what I want you to think about today. I want you to ask yourself, what would you, as members of the Southern Morton Bay Island community, get for that extra $58 million spend this week? I just wanted to bring into context the question because we've talked about the $1.7 billion in community assets and there's been a lot of talk and paraphernalia about no net debt. $1.7 billion of community assets is not a liquid asset. It can't be used to meet your liabilities. What we're talking about when we talk about our community assets are our roads, our pipes, our whatever it might be, our parks. You can't sell them and you certainly can't raise a mortgage over them. Can I just get back to the figures and I will try to make this as exciting as possible. In this last budget of council adopted in June last year, debt was projected to be at the end of this year $68 million. Cash, cash was going to be at $46 million. And anyone's mathematics, that means that we had a debt of $22 million. Even with the most recent budget review that was adopted by council in February, there have been some extra cash coming to the reserves and there has also been a slight reduction in debt. The debt is at $67 million according to that budget review and cash is at $62 million. In anyone's terms, we are still in the negative of $5 million. At this point in time, right now as we speak, we'll just go 
sales rates out of our residents, and we're up to about $90 million in revenue in the bank. We also owe a few million dollars back to Orphanex because we were actually given 10 more dividends than we, were, we deserved. So you also have to take into context that we have constrained revenue in that cash. $15 million of that has been raised through levies, and it can't be used to extinguish debt because it must be spent on its race for. Have I bored you yet? No. <laughs> What the QTC, and I'll just refer to the QTC report, reveals is this council actually intends to keep raising rates faster than the rate of inflation. It's said in the document. And the Queensland Treasury Corporation is happy. <laughs> Even though they note also how hard it is for you now, that your capacity to continue those increases has probably maxed out. They note the limit on how hard you can squeeze a pit. What we need to do for you and for all of Redlands is reduce the cost. We focus so much on the right-hand side of the ledger. We don't focus enough on the left-hand side, on our expenses. We need to reduce the cost to our, so that our income is sufficient to our needs. And this might mean reversing decisions that the current Mayor and Council have made, which amongst other things, has increased senior management. Now, I know that the uh, man has just referred to a benchmark of the DPI and the state government. Frankly, I wouldn't be benchmarking myself to any state government department and their level of middle management. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing we need to be aware of is that we can't continue to increase overheads. This is what has caused the rates in Redland City, rates, fees and charges, to cumulatively increase by 45% over the last four years. That's about four or five times the rate of inflation. And I can guarantee that none of you have had wage increases even, in general, to CPI. How do we do reduce costs? This is what I'm going to do if I have a supportive council and I'm there. Firstly, I'm going to slash the waste and inefficiency. Now, I noted that there was discussion about um, reducing our expenses, or our operational expenses, last year. We have to take the context of the last four years. The reality is, in the first three years of council, our employee costs first three years went up 30%. Our goods and services, our materials and services, which includes contractors and consultants, 43%. The CPI went up 12.5%. Now, you can combine those two and you can work out the math on that. We cannot continue to increase our operating expenditure at those levels. And yes, we did slash the budget. We did have to create voluntary redundancies, which cost you more money than you should have had to pay. Because what they did, they blew the balloon up way too big in the first three years and they had to let out some of the hot air. So what we're at now, cumulatively, is 28% increases over the last four years in employee costs. 36.6% in materials and services, which includes the consultants like the ones who write your Redland Bay Foreshore Master Plan. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that could have probably been money better spent for the two of you throwing the phenomenon. So, yeah. What we also need to do, and this is important to your sustainability, we need to streamline councils so they're working for you, not against you. We need an open door and a council that will occasionally say yes when someone puts in an out-of-the-box development application on your role and might provide you jobs. We need to have an open mind to that and we need to make sure we pay for that, not close the door. We also need to reduce over-regulation so that local businesses can run efficiently. Not only run efficiently if they're existing, but attract businesses to run here and provide you jobs, provide you opportunities, provide you services. And what's happened in the last, and we talked about uh, rates, but in the context of commercial rates, and I, I know there'll be examples of that, commercial rates in the city have gone up 66% the last four years. We're small business in Redlands. I've been in business. I can tell you that I wouldn't be budgeting for those sorts of things without having to put my staff on. That's what happens when you pose unnecessary costs on business and ultimately the same impact happens on residents because they too have a household budget. Just to sum up, and I've said this to you before, you need to be united on these things. I have a pledge that I put out to the Redlands community. My pledge is to pack rates at CPI below. I've been told that that's not possible. Well, my mother used to tell me I couldn't do things, and I think I might have proven her wrong a few times. <laughs> you watch me. Because you cannot afford as a community to have your cost of living going up more than what you were earning. Something has to give. 
So my pledge is to cap rates at CPI or below. It's to cut operations so it's easier for you to do business. It's to streamline council so you know who you're talking to in business and you're not being given the, the palm off by, from one officer to another. We need to constrain the future proposed debt because we're an ageing community and if we don't have a business plan to back bit of debt we go into and that hasn't got a tangible outcome from every single one of us in Redland City, we shouldn't go there. And of course I've actually put that pledge out to 22 candidates and I've asked them to sign it. And 16 that thus far have signed it and I'm asking you to make sure if you support what I'm saying in making it Redlands a more livable place and sustainable future for Southern Waterfowl, you need to support those candidates so that we can support